listening to the Marketing Personalities Podcast, a podcast for growth-minded entrepreneurs that serves up valuable insight and interviews about aligning your marketing strategy with your personality type. Because here's the deal. You shouldn't have to feel fake and salesy in order to grow your business. And you no longer have to. Your marketing strategy can feel good to implement and it can work. You can attract the right clients and customers to your business and grow your profits all while staying true to who you naturally are. So in the name of honest business growth, bring your unique talents, perspectives, and personality to the table and join us on this week's podcast episode to discover marketing that feels good for you. Welcome back to another episode of the Marketing Personalities Podcast. I'm Britt Colo, and I'm here today with Marissa Lawton, who is a scaling strategist for private practice psychotherapists. So cool. Cannot wait to get into this. Marissa, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I've been thinking about this all week and so excited. Yeah, so excited. So Marissa and I are here today to discuss her specific personality type and how she applies it to her business, how she works with her clients, and also her marketing strategy. So we'll get into her specific type and you've already seen it in the title of the podcast episode. She's an ISTJ and kind of an ESTJ too. So we'll get into that interesting little blend there. But before we dig into all of that, I want you to get to know Marissa a little bit better. So Marissa, I I want to ask, beside from being a business owner, we're not going to talk about business right now. Just tell me, who are you in this world? Oh my God, that's actually really hard to answer because I think most of my identity right now is as a business owner. That's why I ask it. <laughs> yeah, so... A few interesting things. I'm a military spouse. My husband and I have known each other since we were 16 and 19. We didn't get married that early. Obviously, that would be weird. (laughs) But we've known each other half of our lives. And then I went to college. He joined the military. And we were kind of off and on during that kind of five-year stint. He dated other people. I dated other people. We realized that we were meant to be. Um, And so we got married in our 20s. We have lived in... Texas, Alaska, Georgia, Texas, and we're going back to Georgia again. So we've moved several times, which is one of the reasons that I am an online business owner. And we also have two little girls, a four and a half year old and a two year old. So when I'm not working, I'm doing my best to be a good mom and doing my best to, you know, keep my marriage strong. (laughs) I guess that's where my identity goes. Wow. That's so cool. That's so cool. You know, I'm I haven't been asking that specific question for very long in the podcast episodes, but I kept getting tripped up on that first question, like, tell us who you are in the world. And and, and it would so quickly go to business and something about that, which I mean, I do the same thing, right? I'm a business owner too. And, and, it, and just within that sentence, you can see that's part of my identity. There was just something about there that's like, you know what? this is more than just our business. This is our personality type. This is how we approach life in general. And so I'm switching it up a little bit. So thanks for riding that train with me a little bit here. (laughs) Yeah, I appreciate the question. I think that's awesome to be able to think about that and to separate ourselves from our businesses a little bit. So it made me think, but I'm glad I kind of went there. Yeah, and I can't wait to hear how the reality of moving quite often and probably in your future moving more. Yeah. (laughs) How that's shaped your business and has shaped what you are encouraging your clients to do as well. So we'll get into that, but tell us about your business now. What do you do and who do you serve? Yeah. So it has been a zigzaggy road to get here. And so right now I work with psychotherapists. So that means counselors, licensed marriage and family therapists, psychologists, social workers, The word therapist can mean so many things. It can mean physical therapist, occupational therapist, massage therapist. So we put the word psycho in front of it to signify mental health, people who work with mental health. The typical trajectory of that is you go to grad school, you get either a master's or a PhD, you work at a mental health agency. And on that track, you can go and become like a clinical director, which becomes like a manager of an agency, or often you go into private practice. And so my specialty is with psychotherapists who are in private practice. And then even more so than that, 
therapists who want to scale past that private practice. Mostly when you're in private practice and you're taught to scale, it's that agency model that graphic designers might be familiar with, like bring on a junior designer underneath you and you scale that way. That's called a group practice for therapists. But I'm trying to help them see that there's so many other ways to scale, especially with online income that they might not have ever heard of or might not have been exposed to. So they don't have to go out of that clinical role and stop seeing clients and helping with mental health uh, and become a manager and become like take on all these skill sets that they don't necessarily have or want with an online income stream. They can stay really in their you know secret sauce or their superpower, but just help on a much bigger scale. So that's kind of what I do is present them with a different option to build their business. Interesting. And I can imagine that what we will dive into and what you bring to the table in your business, in your one-on-one client relationships, in your podcast that you have, it probably reaches even farther than that psychotherapy industry. But I like how, how niched you are in serving those types of people. That really stood out to me when I found you online. And I can also see how your approach to scaling a traditional service-based type of model could really help anybody who's in that one-on-one service-based model scale in a way that isn't that agency that I find a lot of times can be pretty overwhelming. I know it was for me. It's not for everybody, but for a lot of us, it, it definitely is. So yeah, interesting. Okay. Let's dig into those zigzaggy parts. You said your background is in psychotherapy and now you're here helping psychotherapists scale their current model and grow their businesses. Fill it in here. What happened? What got you here? Yeah, I have to go back even a little bit further to my undergrad degree, which is from a prominent business school. And I studied finance. Um, And I also was exposed to marketing in my business degree just because I had to take a lot of electives and, and I chose marketing because I guess I consider myself kind of a walking contradiction and you might have some more insight into this when we get to the personality (laughs) stuff, but like there is this part of me and I think this is more the STJ part that is so like step-by-step, so analytical and finance really did that for me. Like you put this much money in a stock market, you get this much money back. You do this math and you get the answer, right? But then there's this other part of me that has a little bit of a creativity. And so when I was missing that from finance, that's what I got in my marketing classes. So then my husband got orders to Alaska and I'm going to you know, date myself a little bit, but I graduated undergrad in 2009, which is the worst year for college grads economy wise, like only 20% of my graduating class got jobs. So I took any job I could, which happened to be in print advertising. So more in that marketing sphere than the finance sphere, because all of the financial institutions that existed a couple years ago had gone out of business. So not only that, like my industry that I was studying for failed, banks failed. And then my husband got orders to the middle of nowhere, Alaska. And so there was like a credit union and that was it, right? Like (laughs) one bank and one credit union. And it wasn't anything like investment banking, which I had spent the past four years preparing to do. So while I was there, I call it my quarter life crisis. And I was like, what am I going to do? My mom was like, what if you were a life coach? And at that time I was like, I'm 22. How can I be a life coach? This was way before the coaching industry, you know, became what it is. And, And there's a lot of young coaches out there now. But from that, from life coach, I went to, oh, therapist. So I got my master's in mental health counseling and did what I was talking about earlier. Got the job at the agency, got all my hours, got my clinical license. And then being a military spouse, we move. And military spouses, if they're teachers, if they're even hairdressers, anybody that has to have a license, every time you move, it's really difficult. You're paying that state's fee to renew your license. Sometimes they honor your old state and it's just like a straight across transfer. Other times you have to go back to school and get more education or you have to do more hours. So it's a hard process. And so that's when I was like, well, I would thought about coaching before. And I had just had my first daughter. And so I was like, well, what if I coached other moms? And so I was doing like mom coaching and no niche. Like I'm super niche now, but (laughs) then I had 
no niche. And I was just like, yeah, let me talk to new moms. And that business was a struggle because my marketing message was off. I didn't know who I was targeting, all of that kind of stuff. So I took a pause, I regrouped, and I figured out what is it that I really want to do? And I said, you know what? Other therapists have the same licensure problem that I do. Or other therapists are feeling really limited because they can only practice within their state and this was before even online therapy was the thing. Like it, that's a relatively new thing where you can now see your therapist over Zoom, but that was not the case back then. So therapists could really only see people who were willing to drive to see them. And so I realized there was a pain point in that market. I realized I spoke their language. I had the same clinical training as them, but I also had this business background that not a lot of therapists have. So I had this really unique kind of secret sauce or superpower, however you want to say it, that is not prominent in my industry. So that's how I got there. So interesting. So cool. Okay. So with all of that said, and I'm sure that I know for sure the listener is thinking, okay, somebody explain this to me. Like, how do you go from finance to graduate uh, master's degree in mental health counseling and all of this, right? And I know exactly where the through line is. I can see it very clearly, but that's going to get ahead of us. So let's talk about what personality type and really blend of types you have going on here. So what is your most dominant personality type? My most dominant personality type is the ISTJ, but I've taken different Myers-Briggs from, you know, different providers. And sometimes I come up as an ESTJ. And I used to be very extroverted when I was a kid. And now as I get older, I crave some more of those like introverted coping, like going and being by myself. Alone time is a lot more important to me now than it ever used to be when I was younger. So I can see where I flag ISTJ. Yeah. Okay. So, and this is a really common dynamic. You show up primarily as that one I or E, whichever. But then there are moments, there are situations, and then maybe even over time, you see yourself kind of moving to the other side. And this is a great chance and opportunity to remind everybody that's listening. These are preferences. These aspects of your personality type are called preferences for a reason. It's not like you are just this way and you'll never change. And it's not like you're just this way and not the other way ever. These are preferences. And while some psychologists out there from all different decades will say, no, you have your type from very early and then it never changes. I don't know. I want to give it leeway to change and, and allow you that sliding scale because the more I talk to people, it just simply is a sliding scale. It is. And so, I mean, why put yourself into a really closed in box when really it's like kind of a box, but the side is open, you know, like, I mean, yeah, <laughs> you don't have to, you don't really have to be pigeonholed. So I like that you're bringing that you're dominantly ISTJ and you've got some ESTJ in you as well. So I'm going to just riff a little bit and bring everybody up to speed on these two types. And then we'll get back to, okay, how is this really showing up in your specific business model, your coaching style, your marketing strategy? Okay. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to hit ISTJ first because that's the more dominant one. As an ISTJ, you tend to be practical and fact-minded. And because of this, your reliability can't be doubted. And I think this is where that that finance background comes in, that math that like put these two numbers together and you get this. <laughs> Take these two pieces of data and that's what this means, you know? So very practical, fact-minded. And because of this, you also tend to be quite traditional. You like to rely on tried and true methods as opposed to something brand, brand new. That doesn't mean that you don't innovate and you don't take risks and go forward because especially ISTJ entrepreneurs, you still see them taking risks. But that tried and true method really makes you feel safe. And you do you do prefer that, right? You know, you guys can't see us on video, but she's, you know, nodding along yet. Like, yep, yep, yep. Yes, you're right. <laughs> And because of this, I recommend to ISTJs to question how they can use really highly 
trackable tactics in their marketing strategy so they can go back to those metrics and make decisions from there. For an ISTJ just to have a strategy that includes solely relationship building and word of mouth stuff and things that you really can't track, that's not going to feel good for them. So when we're talking trackable tactics, we're looking at things like SEO, search engine optimization, digital ad campaigns, things that have numbers behind them. So Marissa, let me stop there and ask you, do you track all the things in your business? Like, are you a crazy tracker person? I don't track all of the things, but the things I track, I track like crazy. Yeah. Like, even how I've built my programs to help my clients, like when I'm doing launch strategy or something, I'm like, no, we're going to use a link trigger here. They're like, why do we have to have them sign up for the webinar after the challenge? Because we need to know how many people were in the challenge, how many people moved to the webinar so that we could calculate that. Like I'm listening to you and I'm like, yes, I do this all the time. So I do that in my own business. And then I also set that kind of stuff up for clients because that measurability is like, so important to me. Like I feel that in my bones, like how important that is. Yeah. There you go. And I also see ISTJs when they are in the entrepreneur space. And and I've been open about this in other episodes. I don't have a whole lot of ISTJs in my audience. I don't have very many ISTJs on my email list. Like for whatever reason, it's not to say they're not out there. They might just not be attracted to where I am right now. And as the face of the brand, that does matter at this stage in the game. Over time, I will be less and less and the company brand will be more and more. But for right now, I don't know. And from the limited data that I've gotten from ISTJs, I see them most of the time in traditional industries, taking that traditional industry online which is exactly what you're doing. (laughs) So we've got... Yeah. Yeah, we've got this very traditional industry of psychotherapy, mental health, usually done in a private practice in person, and you are helping people scale that model online. Mm -hmm. Well, I said that wrong. Not necessarily scale that model, scale their company online, which is a little different. We'll get into that. And now... Now the ESTJ side of this coin, uh, the more extroverted version of this and how that plays in. So the ESTJ is an excellent administrator. And in, I think it's next week, we'll speak to a hardcore ESTJ. So we'll all get a peek into what that looks like as well. But the ESTJ is an excellent administrator, super good at managing things, or people. And that's usually where they're found, managing managing people. Lots of different things going on at the same time. Other people look into their life and they're like, how in the world are you doing this? And the ESTJ is like, uh, doing what? What are you talking about? Mm-hmm. <laughs> because it comes really natural to spin all the plates, basically. Meanwhile, spin all the plates and take care of their people at the same time, which is a sentinel trait, right? Being part of the sentinel tribe. And because of this, I suggest to an ESTJ to think about how they might be able to leverage an an affiliate or an ambassador program. Because as an ESTJ, you can easily catalyze people to sell for you and be kind of take on your rally cry with you. And then also getting a little ahead of myself, And again, we'll talk more about this next week. But when I say affiliate program or ambassador program, it can also look like a really strategic, well thought out referral system too, right? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be the really digital stuff. It can just be, if you're working one-on-one with someone as an ESTJ, it can come off really, really well. And you you seem very natural asking for a referral and catalyzing your current or past client to find more clients for you. Um, Whereas a lot of us just, that doesn't come super naturally. That's like, Ooh, that kind of feels a little funky to an ESTJ. You're like, yeah, Oh, I can, yeah, I can do that. (laughs) So with all of that together, here's what I see, Marissa, between your funny, what seems like contradictions, the finance, the mental health counseling, and now taking and helping psychotherapists scale their businesses. The through line here is 
you are part of the Sentinel tribe. And as part of the Sentinel tribe, you are a hardcore people helper. Like it's not ever going to be just about you. Yeah. And so while you have that technical thinking brain, which I see coming through the finance and, and also I've, I've heard you kind of say little bits and pieces about the strategies you put into place for your clients. They're very technical. They're very, you know, thinking like, yes, step by step by step. Very cool. And underneath all of that is the want and need like that, that visceral need to help people. Yeah. I actually was going through this analogy the other day. One of my, um, you know, my biz besties, she was saying like, I just want to give people the recipe. Like here's the recipe written down and you have all the ingredients, you have all the steps go. And I was like, I want to be the person that gives them the recipe, goes grocery shopping with them. It's like, how about this apple? Do you like the way this one looks? Cool. Let's put this one in the cart. We get home. We're chopping ingredients together. We're mixing together. We put it in the oven together. It comes out of the oven. We eat it together. Like, So I'm very step-by-step and methodical in that way, but I don't want to just like give somebody the recipe and have them go off and do it on their own. Like, I want to be instrumental with that person and get them the results that I know I can get them, but also that I know that they're capable of. Mm-hmm. And I feel like my ideal, my ideal client or ideal customer is somebody who wants that guide. Like, sure, they could follow a recipe on their own, but they want to have that sip of wine and conversation while it's baking. They want to still feel connected to that person that's, that's teaching them or guiding them. So that really, really resonates. That is a beautiful analogy. I can just feel the the people that are listening right now that who are in the Sentinel tribe along with you just being like, oh my gosh, exactly. <laughs> because I've heard yeah. similar things yeah. come through from other Sentinels, not in such an eloquent way that you just explained. So that is gold. That is total gold. So with that, and I think you just kind of hit on it, what would you say is your unique angle in your business being who you are? How do you approach it in a way that's different from others? Yeah, I think that's, that's really kind of it. I call myself an analogy queen or a metaphor queen, like something that is just always been natural to me. Even when I was a kid is that I could take these concepts that were either overwhelming or just really hard to get your head around and I can just see them in pieces. I can put them in order and I can explain it to somebody in a language that they're going to understand. And then not only can I explain it, but if it comes to the point where they hire me, I can teach it in a step-by-step way, in a systematic way that it's like, if you do step one through six and just keep repeating those steps, you will get to where you want to go. And so some of my ideal customers are like, I love that because that's what I needed was like this roadmap. But sometimes people whose brain don't work that way, they're like, like this. It feels too organized or it feels like I'm reining them in or boxing them in sometimes. So I've come across that a little bit. But for the people who really need that systematic or a breakdown in a way they can understand, I feel like that's something I can really do well. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's really good. As you were explaining that, it kind of popped in. It's like, you know, this kind of sounds like how analysts do things, which is a completely different tribe, but not totally. And and if you're listening and you're thinking, wait, isn't that kind of how analysts work? You know, they take the big picture and they chunk it down and they create the steps. Here's the difference between the analyst tribe and the sentinel tribe. They're, they're both thinkers, but the analyst tribe, they're intuitive thinkers. The sentinel tribe, they're observant thinkers. Yeah. So the analyst tribe, the N and the T in the middle, they are creating your step-by-step process and then they're just handing that to you. They don't usually have that, that like internal need to then see you through it. They'll create the strategy for you. They don't feel super called to walk through every step with you. Some may be a little bit. And in that case, they might be a really close N slash S, which, you know, that's a whole other thing. On the flip side, and what we're really tapping into here with Marissa is that as an observant thinker, for sure, she's got that strategy. She's got the organization. She can create that step-by-step template for you. And she wants to walk through it with you. Yeah. Which is, that's where we get kind of different. Yeah. 
that's coming up for me actually is my audience is asking for me to take one of my group programs and they want it as a self-study. And that really bothers me. Like, I don't want to put a program out there and have somebody buy it and potentially like never open the thing or not get the results that I know the program can give them if they were to do the live calls with me. So at one time, it kind of feels ego serving. Like, who am I to be the person that's going to get them the results? But that is like, it's internal and it feels like so off to me to have some kind of self-study program that, that I'm not actually seeing them through. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Cause it's like, is this my ego thinking I have to be in the process or is this simply my gift? And really I want to serve these people. And I know that the best way to serve these people being that I'm sure service is one of your like top, top priorities being who you are. It doesn't feel right to not be in it with them. I want to know right now, this is completely off the cuff, but I want to know from you, the listener, if you are in the Sentinel tribe and what Marissa just said, how it just doesn't feel quite right to put the product out there and have someone potentially buy it and not use it. If that makes you kind of get a little itchy, like, do you feel that as well? If you do, I want you to screenshot this episode come over and Instagram, tag us both and tell us if you resonate with that. Because I hear it. Yeah. I do. I hear it. I hear it more often than I think anybody wants to admit to that that just doesn't feel right. And it's usually from Sentinels. And I know exactly. I mean, that is why. And that's, again, that comes back to the whole thing. There is not one right way to do this stuff. You got to find the right way for you. Yeah. Because in reality, I mean, Marissa, sometime down the, in the future, you might get to a point where you're like, you know what? I can release this. And if it is an egoic driven thing and you realize like, you know what? I can release this. I can let that be. And if someone buys it and you could release that in the future. But until that day comes where that genuinely doesn't feel bad for you, if you were to still push through that icky feeling and allow that product to be bought in a self-guided DIY format, you probably wouldn't market it very well, to be completely honest, because you wouldn't believe in it, right? That's exactly what's happening. I pre-launch right now. My challenge starts Monday and I'm just not even involved. Like I don't, oh. not invested at all in it. So that's like a huge revelation because that's actually happening right now. Oh, wow. I just kind of got chills. Yeah. I thought this was going to be my biggest launch ever. And then when everybody was like, oh, but we want a self-study version. I was like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it really like popped my balloon. And I don't think I've even really kind of recovered from it yet. Like it felt like it took my business in a whole different direction. And I'm still like, like climbing out of that a little bit. So that was one question that I did have for you versus like the introvert versus the extrovert is if I'm going to grow... I need to go towards something self-study or, you know, that I can just get, sell, you know, either, either passively or sell to the masses because right now I'm doing group programs and group programs are what feels really good for me because I can be like really involved with the cohort that I'm guiding. And I love that, but I also only have like 10 spots. And in, unless I astronomically raise the price, then I'm never going to scale and I'm never going to grow, right? So I've been toying around with the idea of a membership site because I feel like that would allow me to be at a bigger scale, but still be involved. But to me, that feels like a really extroverted idea. So I didn't know what you thought about that. Oh, that's good. That's really good. Well, to back up a little bit, yeah, you can, you can raise the price. Maybe not, mm -hmm. you know, astronomically right away, but over time with more experience in the program for you, that whole experience will be more valuable. So the price can go up. And I think there are interesting kind of ninja ways to work in that personal touch and, and even a high touch experience for someone who has bought a self-guided course and isn't even expecting the high touch and you can plug that in as like a surprise and delight element a to help them for sure because you know that's going to serve them yeah. and b to satiate that need to be in the process that need to to make sure am i really serving you with this 
right? Yeah. So I think that there are some, you know, there's some kind of compromise in there. The idea, this is totally off the cuff, the, the idea of the membership site, you know, they're, they're really popular right now. I firmly believe they're not for everyone. I would say that the membership sites tend to be more driven toward that extroverted person. And I see, yeah. I see the need regardless of if you're introverted or extroverted or whatever. If you're in the Sentinel tribe, if you go toward the membership site or any kind of community, try to remember that if you're creating this, you need to allow those members, those community people, whoever's in there to realize that they can support each other as well. So you don't fall into the trap of supporting all of your members all at once. Yeah. Um, because memberships can get way, way big, right? Like they're extremely scalable when done correctly for a sentinel who really, really wants to serve. Um, if they're not careful and they don't go in with the right expectations set for themselves and for their community members, they can get real bogged down real fast. Am I saying that you can't do a membership site without feeling really well balanced? No, like you, I believe you totally can. That's my one little like, let's think about this before we pull the trigger on it. Yeah, that totally resonates because even in my free Facebook group, anytime someone comments, I want to comment. And again, I don't know if that's ego-driven or if that's service-driven, probably a bit of both of them being really honest, but it's like, I want to give the answer to their question. So I can totally see that as being something that I would have to have reins around. And also something when you were talking about the ESTJ is something that really stood out to me is the relationships, but strategic relationships, because out of everything, relationships come harder to me. Like I can pitch a podcast, I can pitch a guest post or, or whatever, like that doesn't phase me at all. But continuing on a relationship with somebody is harder for me. Like having it actually be a genuine connection that isn't just like, okay, thanks for the, the spot on your podcast. Now, how do we stay either friends or, or even just business acquaintances or whatever after this? That part's hard. So when I think about the membership site, the community fostering, that's the part that, that makes me nervous. I have no doubt that I could set up, you know, let's do a quarterly plan. Let's do this lesson uh, every month. And then we're gonna have a Q&A call and a hot seat call, like the structure is so in my vein. Like, I love that. But then having my members talk amongst each other, how do I facilitate that? That is what scares me or like makes me feel like doubtful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in truth, especially as an, well, both ISTJ, ESTJ, you tend to be quite the integrator and that's a buzzword right now. Try to open your mind to what that means. It doesn't mean visionary versus integrator. It's just you tend to be feeling really good when you are integrating, when you are figuring out the how, when you are really in there and doing it. Yes. And so relationships aren't don't always work that way. <laughs> They're not always like to the point. They don't always, you know, one plus one equals two. That's not always how relationships work. And so that's where the disconnect is. So if you decided yes. to move forward with... And I give this advice to any ESTJ who's trying to work in an affiliate program, ambassador program, a better referral system, whatever that looks like, catalyzing someone to bring people to them. I always, always encourage having someone in your circle on your team to help manage the relationships. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. You know, that can look so many different ways. And I, I know every time I say the word team, some people who are just starting out are like, no, nope, that's, I can't do that. Well, try really hard not to block yourself to it because it could look like tapping into someone who is really good at following up and creating relationships and seeing how they do it. Like see how, if you could plug into, honestly, I would most recommend plugging into an ISFJ because they are in your Sentinel tribe, but they're super good <laughs> at the relationship side of things. So if you could tap yeah. into someone with those attributes and see how they have that kind of templated out, you probably will learn some things that even if you don't hire them or bring someone in specifically to do this for you, you could maybe learn their template, take their knowledge base and apply it to make it at least simpler. So you don't have to figure it out, you know, like that starting from scratch on that relationship side of things can feel really overwhelming. 
I feel like that taps into that observer piece of me because I, I can do that well. I can watch what somebody else is doing and then I can replicate it. Yep. And then after I've replicated it a few times, I can put my own spin on it and do kind of what feels right for me. But I do learn really well that way. So I love that suggestion. Yep. You love that template because it's organized. Yes. I love it. And that fits for your brain, right? Yeah. All full circle. I love it. And I love that you brought some questions to this because that makes it so much richer. I cannot wait to hear from listeners what is standing out for them, what other questions they have as it relates to this conversation. I know that my Instagram DMs are going to be pretty popping today. So I am, I'm really excited about that. <laughs> okay. So I would love to bring us back down, kind of land the plane. And I wonder, what would you say to a fellow ISTJ slash ESTJ, all this stuff that we've been talking about, about you, what would you say to them as your best advice to move forward in their business? Yeah, I think for me, what something that I would have needed to hear is kind of, you've already mentioned it. There's no right way to do this because I search for the right way, like the structured A to B way a lot. And sometimes you just have to let it go kind of wonky and see what's going to happen. And trust in yourself that you're going to be able to make sense of it because that's what you're really good at is making sense of it. So sometimes it needs to get messy for you to see all the pieces like laid out on the floor and to be able to organize them and put them where they go. Don't try and be always forcing it along the way. Let it get a little messy sometimes. Thank you for taking it there because while we talk about everyone's strength on this podcast and for you as an ISTJ slash ESTJ and in the Sentinel tribe, we're all, you know, this entire month, we're talking about how you're so good at organization and so good at templates. And sometimes when that empowering message is said a lot, and then you have like a a kind of disorganized week and things are just kind of hitting the fan. You're like, wait, am I doing this all wrong? Like, who am I? Then none of us have the perfect day. I mean, none of us have the perfect day, the perfect week. While you do have your strengths, it doesn't mean that you're 100% strong all the time. I mean, even Olympic athletes who are really strong in whatever they're competing in, they take rest days. They have practices that just suck and don't feel awesome. So, you know, you can release the pressure on that valve a little bit. And I'm so glad. Yeah. Sometimes you can let it be messy. And then from that mess, you know, you're going to organize it. You know, you're going to figure it out. Like, no, no doubt. That's so cool. Yeah. I am so glad you brought that to us. All right. So um, before we go, Marissa, I want to make sure everybody knows where to find you online. So where do they go? And also where do they go to listen to your podcast? Yeah. So my website's really easy. It's just marissalawton.com. It speaks really heavily to therapists, but really if anybody considers themselves a helper or, you know, a heart-centered entrepreneur, I feel like my message will resonate. And they can also go anywhere they find their podcasts to the Empathy Rising podcast. Talks a lot about, you know, slow, intentional marketing and how to scale in a way that's intuitive and feels good for you. You don't have to always be perfect. Because I think that that's something that I'm in recovery from is perfectionism. So perfect. I love the name of that podcast, Empathy Rising. I saw a line in your copy on your website. I think it was on your about page. And I actually copied it over into my notes for this episode because I just thought it was so good and spoke so well to psychotherapists as a just people in the mental health industry. And I think it speaks really, really well to anybody in the Sentinel tribe too. And that was empathy and success do not have to be mutually exclusive. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And then another line said, you can show up for your clients and show up for your business at the same time. Holy smokes, if that does not give an empowering message and exactly the kind of thing I want a Sentinel to hear, oh goodness. Thank you for that. (laughs) It's so good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think we get caught up in the fact that if we want to make more money or if we want to scale, then that means we're not going to be as present or as helpful. And I don't think that's the case. I think you can be just as effective with whoever you're serving and want to make money. Like there's nothing wrong with that. Totally, totally. And I can't wait to hear how all of this specific conversation guides even you 
into this next launch you've got and how you're doing things. I can't wait for, for an update on that. So um, in a couple of weeks, we'll definitely have to regroup and see what's going on. So, all right, you've heard her. Everybody go check her out. She's at marissalawton.com. You can listen to her podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. It's called Empathy Rising Podcast. And of course, to find your marketing personality type, go to marketingpersonalities.com. to this episode of the Marketing Personalities Podcast. Now it's time to connect your marketing strategy to your personality type. Go to marketingpersonalities.com slash MPP to download your marketing personality type full report. Use the code MPP at checkout to get $10 off. And that's a super special code for podcast listeners as a way to say thank you for being here. In your full report, you'll learn about your personality type, how it relates to the work you do, what your best marketing strategy includes so you can start implementing it right away, what your worst marketing strategy includes so you can avoid it, and so much more. Go to marketingpersonalities.com slash MPP to get your full report and use the code MPP at checkout to receive $10 off your purchase. And one more thing before you skip on to the next podcast, would you please share this episode with your entrepreneur friends who also need to feel good about their marketing strategies? Take a quick screenshot of your podcast app right now and share it out via text, Facebook, or my favorite, Instagram. Remember to tag me at Marketing Personalities in the photo so I can be sure to send you a huge high five and thank you for sharing the love. This podcast is edited and produced by the Podcast Engineers. They're pretty great, and you can find them at podcastengineers.com. That's all for now. Thanks as always for listening, and I'll catch you back here next week on the Marketing Personalities Podcast. Love ya. Bye.